Welcome back to Autumn Ridge. My name is Rick Henderson. I'm the senior pastor here. And it's vacation season. Have you gone on vacation yet? Maybe you're gearing up for vacation. I'm going to share with you a little bit about my philosophy of vacation. I hate and I don't want to go to a resort and a place that's surrounded by poverty. Now, I'm happy to go on mission trips to places that are surrounded by poverty. If I can be a part of the solution to senseless generational poverty, I want to invest in that. But when it comes to going to a resort and a place that's surrounded by an impoverished community, I I just don't want to do that. Now, some of you might say that I need to reconsider because if I go and spend money in a broken economy that will benefit the greater community, you might be right. It's keener economic minds than mine that need to answer that question. Now, the reason that I don't want to go isn't because I'm a good person. I don't consider myself to be a good person. And when you hear what I'm going to say next, you won't consider me to be a good person either. The reason that I don't want to go to resorts that are in places surrounded by poverty is when it's playtime, when it's vacation time, I want to pretend like problems don't exist. I want to escape the things that make me feel guilty or responsible. I want to escape the things that stress me. And maybe you do too. And if I'm really honest, there's this gravitational pull, this constant gravitational pull in me, and it's not just during vacation time, it's all of life. There's this current that's pulling me and pushing me. Maybe you can relate to this, that it's just this temptation to live my life as comfortably as possible, ignoring as many problems as possible. Can you relate to that? Now, that view of life and that approach to life is understandable, and yet it's impossible. That approach to life is understandable, and yet it would not be what's most beneficial. Right now, our moment in history has inescapable problems that cannot be ignored. So let me ask you this question. When life presents you with choices that you can't ignore, what is it that clarifies and validates how you should respond? I don't even need to say anything. I'm just going to show you some pictures. And these pictures illustrate the wildly different responses that people have to the exact same thing. This or this. 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 Now, I know most of these things don't come down to an A or B kind of option. Many of these subjects, probably all of these subjects, are far more complex and far more nuanced than a simple either-or kind of choice. And yet we have to, we have to make a choice. These, things are, are, these are the kind of things that we have to respond to. These are the kind of things that we simply cannot ignore. And as you look at these things, isn't it interesting that people from the same point in time, from people who are in the exact same places, respond wildly differently to the exact same thing? And if you were to survey people, what you would find is the way that people respond to these things makes the most sense to them. And the thing that makes perfect sense to you doesn't make any sense to people who are on the other side of the situation than you. I want to return us to something that we thought about in week one, and it's this right here. Your answers to the most important questions of life will serve as the architects for the most important things in your life. Now, the most, the, the most important questions of life can be boiled down to four critical questions, and they're these right here. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. How do you answer those questions? This series is all about coming to terms, really, with these tough topics. Now, how you answer those questions, you could probably you probably land somewhere on this continuum. I have a picture I want to show you. On this end, this is the religious end of continuum, and over here is the irreligious end of the continuum. And if you're more on the irreligious end of the continuum, people who are there, they tend to doubt that God is a serious part of the answers or that God's included at all or God's relevant at all to what the answers are. And if that's you, you're probably just as committed to meaning and morality as I am. And you base probably meaning and morality on carefully considered, thoughtfully reasoned arguments. And yet, your view is not without its challenges. Stephen Jay Gould was a guy who was on the far end of this continuum. Stephen Jay Gould was a paleontologist, an evolutionary biologist. Uh, He was a historian of science. And he talked openly about the challenges of his own irreligious approach. He said this, 
We cannot read the meaning of life passively in the facts of nature. We must construct these answers ourselves from our own wisdom and ethical sense. There is no other way. Now, if you read Stephen Jay Gould more broadly, you probably already know this, that that he would say this, that life has no more inherent meaning for us or life has no more objectively true moral law for us than it does for sharks, bats, and viruses. So we have to construct these things from our best thinking, right? And you can be a a good-hearted, intelligent person and do that. And yet, if you were to ever act or you were to ever believe that your sense of morality and meaning was truer than someone else's, you'd probably discover that you're living in contradiction to your answers to those four major questions. Let's look at the other end of the continuum. On this end is our, our religious folks. And, and if that's you if, you, if you find yourself here, you see God as part of the answers or the main part of the answers to the most important questions of life. And if that's you, you're probably just as committed to meaning and morality as I am. And you probably base meaning and morality on carefully considered reasoned responses to what you read in the Bible and to to church teachings. And yet your view is not without its challenges either. While if you're on this end, you might say to these people, you can't be a good person simply because you're making it up. And they might say back to you, well, you can't be a good person if you're doing it just to earn stuff, to get a reward, or to get into heaven. If you're on this end of the continuum, you might say, hey, your meaning and morality is self-made. And if you're on this end, you might say to the other, yeah, but yours is selfish. Both sides have a point. These are tough topics. These are important topics. And each week, we've been looking to an unlikely source. We've been looking to a guy named James. He was the pastor of the very first church ever. He's very likely the brother of Jesus. And into this conversation, James would say this right here. Faith works. Does meaning and morality, does it come down to a simple either or option, self-made or self-ish? James would say there's a third way. There's another option. And remembering that this word faith means allegiance, James would say allegiance to Jesus gives you a coherent set of answers to life's most important questions. And today we're going to get to that third approach. We're going to get to that coherent set of answers on the other side of a very raw conversation about some raw and ugly things. We're going to get there on the other side of a conversation about discrimination and judging people. So let's look at what James has to say. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated? Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? It's here that we see the nasty, enslaving nature of morally broken choices. That's what the Bible refers to as sin. And this is what happens. Lies will take up residence in our minds and refuse to move out. And it becomes incredibly difficult to tell the difference between truth and lies because we're surrounded by people who believe and are intoxicated by the same lies that we are. Lies like this. You are better if you're better off. You are less if you have less. And there is this constant pervasive temptation to attach dignity to achievement and to acquisition. It's simply in the air that we breathe. And so consequently, this is what we do. We begin to defer to and try to attach our people, attach ourselves to people who we see as more valuable because it gives us a sense of value. And so discrimination, it runs rampant. As this morning, or this evening, whenever you're watching, I want to run through a few reasons for discrimination. Here's one right here. We confuse net worth with self-worth. We confuse net worth with self-worth. It would probably be helpful for you to know that many Christians, the overwhelming majority of Christians in the first century, were phenomenally poor. Some came from generational poverty. Others came from wealth, but they lost it all as a result of being persecuted for being followers of Jesus. They were mercilessly and relentlessly bullied. And the sentiment of the day is that they were poor and dirty 
Christians. In the second century, there was a guy named Celsus. He was a Greek philosopher, and what he wrote perfectly encapsulated society's attitude towards Christians in the very beginning. And what I'm going to read to you comes from something he wrote about Jesus' followers. Like a swarm of bats or ants creeping out of their nest, or frogs holding symposium amid a swamp, or worms in a convention in a corner of mud, those dirty and poor Christians. No one wants to be thought of that way. And no one wants to think of themselves that way. And yet, that kind of discrimination was a reality in the early church. That kind of discrimination was a reality in the early church because they held on to the world's value system. And it resulted in senseless insecurity. Whenever we attach our sense of value Whenever we attach our security, our sense of significance to the wrong thing, it will always and ultimately result in our own insecurity. Here's another reason for discrimination. We forget our value in him. We forget our value in Jesus Christ. And what James does, it's like he's taking a baseball bat to discrimination. He's taking a baseball bat to the way that people think. He attacks their thinking. He doesn't attack people. Now hear me on this. Any approach that attacks people is doomed to fail. Any approach that tries to change and improve society that hinges on attacking people, that's doomed to fail. Any political ideology or strategy that rests on attacking people, it's doomed to fail. James doesn't attack people. He attacks their thinking by appealing to their identity as believers in our glorious Jesus Christ. And I'm convinced that what he's doing is he's trying to give them a different lens through which to see themselves. And he's essentially saying this, Jesus left heaven because he values you. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. And why would he go through all of that? Because he values you. Because he loves you. And any time we detach our sense of value or significance from Christ's view of us. We devalue ourselves. Whenever people engage in discrimination, any kind of discrimination, whenever people engage in discrimination, it is always because they have misplaced or misevaluated their own value and their own significance. And it always leads to greater insecurity. And that's the thing that fuels discrimination. So hear me on this. If you are in Christ, if you are a follower of Christ, and you evaluate yourself or other people based on wealth, that's absurd. If you are in Christ, if your identity is in him, and you evaluate yourself or other people based on race or any sort of social standing, that's absurd. If you are in Christ and you treat people differently simply because of economic status, that is absurd. It is simultaneously sinful and irrational, and it would be an outward expression that is in contradiction to what we believe. Let's look back at what James says. He says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor? Has not God set his affection on? Has God not set his heart on people who are poor? People who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. This is serious. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? Here James, I believe, gives us a third reason for discrimination. It's this right here. We forget their value to him. Or who are they? James is immediately talking about the poor, but I want you to think about it like this. We forget their value to him. Who are they? It's any person or any group who you see as other. Now, there are a lot of different views on the Old Testament, and there are a lot of different understandings of how God is portrayed in the Old Testament. I find it a bit heartbreaking. It's unfortunate that too many people are uninformed or underinformed on just how ferocious God's love is for the poor and for the immigrant and for the vulnerable as expressed in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, God instituted a system In the Old Testament, God instituted a set of laws that would eliminate generational and senseless poverty. Think about that for a second. 
Since 1965, our nation has spent $23 billion, I'm sorry, $23 trillion. Since 1965, our nation has spent $23 trillion on a war on poverty, and we've barely moved the needle. And yet way back in the Old Testament, God instituted a system, a set of laws that would eliminate generational and senseless poverty. And yet it persisted. And for the only reason is that people ignored God's commands because of discrimination and greed. Here's some of what I'm talking about. This is what we find in the Old Testament. God made provision for the poor who can't afford to give offerings. Your worship is just as valuable as someone who is more wealthy than you. It has nothing to do with your economic status. There is temporary indentured servitude instituted, not chattel slavery, but temporary indentured servitude instituted to eliminate debt. And when you were released, the person who you worked for, they had to give you financial provisions to start new life. And your rights were protected throughout. Your dignity was protected throughout. Essentially, this was how it would work. You go to someone and you say, I'm in debt. They pay off all your debts. You agree to work for them for a number of years. They have to they have, to, they have to care for you, provide for all your needs to protect your rights, to protect your dignity. And when your term is done, they give you a financial starter pack to ensure that you thrive and avoid debt moving into the future. Imagine if your bank or a visa treated you like that. Let's continue. Possessions sold to settle debts were supposed to be repurchased by a relative and returned to you. Every seven years and every 50 years, all debts were forgiven. And indentured servitude was canceled, and all land was returned to its original owner. Your dad could lose the family farm, and yet it was guaranteed that it would eventually be returned to your family. Let's continue. All loans to the poor were interest-free. Fields were not to be fully harvested by owners so that the poor could harvest food. These are loved, soaked, carefully considered laws and decrees in a system put together to protect people from the ravages of senseless and generational poverty. And whenever we engage in discrimination, we attack the heart of God. And even if our discrimination exists only in our thoughts and only in our attitudes and only in jokes that we tell to our friends, our thoughts and our attitudes attack the very heart of God. So what's the answer? What's the gospel response to this? James makes it very clear. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, and you're doing right. Here, James basically just quotes his bro, Jesus. And Jesus made it incredibly simple. Jesus made it so simple, we don't have to remember any rules. We don't have to remember any commands. It boils down to this right here. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? Anything that violates love as defined by Jesus is a sin. Anything that doesn't violate love as defined by Jesus is good. And this truth, this was the singular focus of the Apostle Paul. It's not just the main thing, it's the only thing. Check this out. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote this, the only thing that counts The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And this is where we begin to see the third way, that our approach to meaning and morality is not self-made and it's not selfish. The gospel is totally different from those two things. I want to show you this. God loves us, and so we love him in return. I mean, because God loves us, that transforms us from the inside out, and we now love other people. And because God has given to us so graciously and lavishly in Christ, he's given us everything in Christ. We've been given everything we're ever going to get. And so now we are free to love others in the way we've been loved. And we do the good that we do, and we reject the evil that we reject, not because we're trying to get anything from anybody or trying to get anything from God. We simply do it for the only reason of love. It's not self-made because Jesus is the one who is love and he defines love for us. It's not selfish because we're not trying to earn anything from God. We've already been given everything in Christ. And so now we're free to give simply because we want to do what's best, what's in the best interest for others. That is a life marked by and motivated by the gospel. James continues to press into this. He says, 
But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. He's talking about the law of love from Christ. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I want us to think about this. Our desire to judge others, it's not too strong. It's actually too weak. It takes no effort. It takes no energy. It takes no courage. And it certainly doesn't take any humility to fixate on the wrongs of other people. You know what takes constant effort? You know what takes guts and humility? To turn the spotlight on ourselves and to evaluate ourselves and to hold ourselves accountable to God's standard. It's the easiest thing in the world to focus on how other people get it wrong. But the gospel does something inside of us. It transforms us and we begin to evaluate ourselves. We hate our sin more than we hate the sin of other people. We talk about our moral mess-ups more than we talk about the moral mess-ups of other people. Someone who has been transformed and captivated by this incredible love and grace and mercy of Jesus, this becomes their anthem. Love everybody. Hate your own sin. Love everybody. Hate your own sin. Now, in the passage that we just read, if it sounded to you like James is saying, hey, we earn mercy from God by giving mercy to other people, that's not what he's saying. I don't have time to get into that today. That's really going to be the main course of next week. I hope you tune in. I hope you come back for that. I think it's going to be fantastic. But right now, I want us to zero in on something that I think we absolutely cannot ignore. And as we zero in on this, I believe we're going to begin to see the genius of James. James, first of all, he presents the law of God as an all or nothing proposition. Think of it in the same way that you would think, it, think of an egg. I wish I had an egg with me, but imagine I'm holding an egg. Maybe you want to go grab one. If you break an egg, if you crack an egg, the whole thing is cracked. It would make no sense whatsoever to, to point out all the places where the egg isn't cracked. If it's broken, it's broken. It's the same way with the law of God. Now, it's interesting. I find it incredibly interesting that James choose to, chooses to compare and contrast, hey, you keep the law, don't <laughs> commit adultery, and compares and contrasts that with not keeping the command to not murder. James is talking to a group of people who pride themselves on sexual, on sexual piety, and that's a good thing. Uh, we should honor God's command for sex. He's the one who invented sex. Thank you, Jesus. He's the designer. He's the inventor. We should do what he says. Now, in a few minutes, I'm going to say something, and it might make some of you mad, so you're going to need to rewind it and listen to what I just said there. But James is he's writing to people who pride themselves on sexual piety, and yet he starts to imply that maybe they're a little murdery, right? He begins to imply that the same twisted, morally broken evil that results in murder has stained their hands. Now, these people have not literally killed anyone. Murder is taking life. And yet discrimination, any kind of discrimination, all kinds of discrimination are taking from life. And what James has done is he has isolated and pointed out their hypocrisy, and he put his finger on it, and he presses down hard. And it's as if he's saying this, yeah, you keep it clean between the sheets, but you get the equivalent of murder in your hearts. That's a serious statement. And the message that James is giving to them, I think it's a message that the American church needs to hear. Because collectively, collectively, American evangelicals have gotten this wrong over the last 30 years. And in just a second, we're going to see a broken attitude that James is engaging. And this broken, wrong attitude. Maybe James wouldn't say that you're guilty of it. Maybe it wouldn't apply to you. Maybe it wouldn't apply to Autumn Ridge Church or over the history. Maybe it would. 
And yet I think James would say this absolutely applies to many Jesus followers and to many churches in America, especially over the past 30 years. And as I look over the past 30 years, I think there are times that James would say to me, this has been your attitude and your attitude is wrong. And this is the wrong attitude he's pointing out. My sexual piety is more important than my indifference to the poor. Now, there's another way that this broken, wrong attitude is portrayed. Your sexual choices, the sexual choices of people who follow an approach to life that's different from Jesus, your sexual choices are more problematic than my indifference to the poor. And if James were here today, I bet he would say this. If we changed that broken attitude, the kind of influence and trust we would have in our culture today would be very different if over the past 30 years we elevated our love for the poor and we didn't ignore them, if we didn't act like the most important sin was sexual sin, but we honored Christ with our lives and we loved others just as ferociously and just as passionately as God loved us. I think what James would say, I think what Jesus would say, I think what the Apostle Paul would say is stop judging people. I think what he would say is stop being more eager to judge people than you are to love people. Hate your own sin more than you hate the sins of others. Choose mercy over judgment and live your life by this question. What does love require of me? What would your house look like if you lived that way? What would our neighborhoods look like? What would your workplace look like? What would our church look like? What would our city look like if we were committed to live that way? Maybe this will help. It all went down on this block in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Back in 05, Jamel McGee says he was minding his own business when a police officer accused him of and arrested him for dealing drugs. You saying the officer made it up? Yeah, it was all made up. Of course, a lot of accused men make that claim but not many arresting officers agree. So you phonied the report? I did, I I falsified the report. This is former Benton Harbor police officer, Andrew Collins. Were you just trying to chalk up an arrest? Yeah, basically the start of that day, I was gonna make sure I had another drug arrest. And in the end you put an innocent guy in jail? Correct, yeah. You lost everything. I lost everything. My only goal was to seek him when I got home and to hurt him. Really? That was my goal. Eventually, that crooked cop was caught, served a year and a half for falsifying many police reports, planting drugs and stealing. Of course, Jamal was exonerated, but he still spent four years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Today, both men are back here in Benton Harbor, which is a small town, maybe a little too small. Hey guys, thank you. Last year, by sheer coincidence, they both ended up at Mosaic, a faith-based employment agency where they now work side by side in the same cafe. Excuse me. And it was in these cramped quarters that the bad cop and the wrongfully accused had no choice but to have it out. And I said, honestly, I have no explanation. All I can do is say I'm sorry. And Jamel says, That was all it took. That was pretty much what I needed to hear. Today, they're not only cordial. Saturday, we went to the trampoline park. They're friends. Uh, You know, we talk about life. Such close friends. Not long ago, Jamel actually told Andrew he loved him. And I just started weeping because he doesn't owe me that. Uh, I don't deserve that, you know? Did you forgive for his sake or for yours? No, for our sake. Not just us, for our sake. Jamel went on to tell me about his Christian faith and his hope for a kinder (laughs) mankind. He wants to be an example. So now he and Andrew give speeches together about the importance of forgiveness and redemption. Grab this one, set it over there. And clearly, if these two guys from the coffee shop can set aside their bitter grounds, what's our excuse? Let me leave you with this. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We get that, don't we? You know, I mean, there's just something inside of you. There's something inside of me. We understand this. And we love it when it's applied to us. Mercy triumphs over judgment. 
I am so grateful, as many of you are, I'm so grateful that Jesus related to me that way. And I want to relate to others that way. How about you? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are more committed to mercy than judgment, that you would pour out your judgment, your appropriate judgment for sin on Christ so that I could be given mercy. Help me to see others the same way you see me and the same way you see them. Help me to take my next step. Help us to take our next step of loving all others in the same way that you've loved us. And it's in the name of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ in whom we believe that we pray. Amen.